designed to train workers for high demand, good paying jobs in various industries throughout the Inland Empire. If you want a pathway to a high paying job and the respect that comes with a union contract, visit 1932trainingcenter.org to enroll today. That's 1932trainingcenter.org. One of the best ways to build a healthier local economy is by shopping locally. Teamster Advantage is a shop local program started by Teamster Local 1932 that has brought together hundreds of locally owned businesses to provide discounts for residents who make shopping locally their priority. Everything from restaurants like Corky's to fun times at SB Raceway and much, much more. If you're not currently a Teamster and you want access to these local business discounts, contact Jennifer at 909-889-8377, extension 224. Give her a call. That number again is 909-889-8377, extension 224. Labor unions built the middle class, and the middle class built America. That's the message from Teamsters Local 1932, a strong and successful labor union based in San Bernardino that represents over 14,000 hardworking people across the Inland Empire. The Teamsters are ready to help you organize for better pay, increased benefits, and improved working conditions. Reach out to Teamsters 1932 at Teamsters1932.org backslash organize to speak with an organizer today. KCAA Loma Linda. The Legacy KCAA 1050 AM and Express 106.5 FM. NBC News Radio, I'm Lisa Taylor. The second GOP presidential debate has come and gone. Michael Kessner reports. During last night's debate on the Fox News Channel, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie took several shots at former President Donald Trump, accusing him of being afraid to defend his record on the debate stage. Trump, the current GOP frontrunner, chose to skip the debate again. House Republicans are holding the first hearing in their impeachment investigation of President Biden. Republicans are looking into whether the president improperly profited off his son Hunter Biden's foreign business dealings while vice president. Joe Biden lied to the American people that he never spoke to his family about their business dealings. He lied by telling the American people that there was an absolute wall between his official government duties and his personal life. Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer claims investigations revealed how Biden abused his public office for his family's financial gain. Maryland Democrat Jamie Raskin, meanwhile, said Republicans have launched an impeachment inquiry on a long-debunked and discredited lie. He also slammed Republicans for holding the impeachment hearing just days before the government is set to shut down, as Congress has yet to pass a government funding bill. Federal funding is set to expire Saturday night if lawmakers fail to strike a deal. Conservatives in the House are pushing for deep spending cuts that won't make it through the Democratic-controlled Senate, while Senate leaders are pushing a plan to fund the government through mid-November. The American soldier released from North Korea this week arrived in Texas overnight. The Army private was reportedly facing disciplinary problems when he crossed the border between North and South Korea in July while on a bus tour of the demilitarized zone. British actor Michael Gambon, best known to American audiences for his role as the headmaster of Hogwarts, Albus Dumbledore, in the Harry Potter movies, has died. A statement from his family early this morning read, Michael died peacefully in the hospital with his wife Anne and son Fergus at his bedside following a bout of pneumonia. Michael Gambon was 82. You're listening to the latest on NBC News Radio. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. I'm told there's uh, some kind of uh, thing going on out in California. A bunch of people going to be talking over each other uh, about nonsense. I'm sure there'll be some climate denial. I'm sure there'll be some some attacks on workers. I'm sure there'll be some folks saying how much they can't stand the UA. I'm sure, I'm sure that they will be making their ploy and their play for working people by attacking uh, said working people, much like Trump. Evidently, Trump right now, as we uh, as we are here, he's addressing um, 
UAW members at a non-union facility. This is what's being presented. This this is what's being presented to us. He's gonna they're they're UAW striking UAW members um, at this non-union facility, and <laughs> he's telling all of the faithful how wonderful he is for working people, and yet. When you look at the record, when you look at what he actually did in the four years that he was president, um, not good, not good at all. And the thing that I, I, I got to tell you, I, I, I love the fact that the Biden folks are not taking this lying down because you've got to attack back. Because what's interesting to me, and this is you know something that came up in a conversation today that that in the old days. Republicans used to lie. All politicians used to lie when there's a kernel of truth. And then you, you just spin something a little bit. There's just a little spin job that, that you know, that, you know, you, you, know you, you make you embellish a bit. But there's still the kernel of truth. There's still that one little bit where you go, well, that's true. But everything else is total bunk. Now it's not there's no kernel of truth anymore. It's all bunk. It's like, you know, it's like walking through a cow, a cow field. Uh, you're stepping in all of the, well, <laughs> uh, and this is kind of the Trump, the Trump pitch that there's no reality in what he is saying. You know, I'm going to be the one who fights for your family. Well, you didn't. I'm going to who be the one who brings jobs back. Well, you didn't. I'm going to be the one that's good for the economy. No, you were actually terrible. You inherited a very good Obama economy, and you figured out how to how to how to booger that up. When you left as the 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 well the Herbert Hoover of our generation, um, you should have gone away in shame. But no, no, what they've done masterfully is they've they've re they've they've revisited history. And I like the fact that the the Biden folks today came out with. With a video going, hey, uh, you know, you remember what you said? You remember what? Uh, you remember what? What? What you did? Uh, here, here's here's the video of of Trump's words, and then, well, the reality of what happened with with Trump's words. Here, here's the video. If I'm elected, you won't lose one plant. You'll have plants coming into this country. You're gonna have jobs again. You won't lose one plant. I promise you that. Operations at GM's Warren Transmission Plant end today. All the people that are left inside know this is their last shift here. Those jobs have left Ohio. They're all coming back. They're all coming back. A large American factory stopped production today after more than half a century. 1,600 workers at the General Motors plant in Lordstown, Ohio are affected by this. It's hard to even fathom that I'm not going to be coming back tomorrow. No more empty factories that sit there and rot, like all over Pennsylvania, all over New York State, all over Maryland. The GM Baltimore Operations Plant in White Marsh is preparing to cease production. Yeah, I mean, this is, we could go through the whole, the whole thing uh, even further. You know, he made all these promises. And again, I said from the beginning, uh, the reason my family voted for him, you know, otherwise known as the basket of deplorables, um, it wasn't racism. It wasn't homophobia. It wasn't any of that stuff. It was he was going to save the jobs. He was going to bring back those union jobs. He was going to bring back that working class pride. People bought it. He did none of it. In fact, told those people don't move in Lordstown. And we met some of these folks when we were doing our our working class heroes tour. Don't leave. Don't sell your home. Don't take that job transfer. You're going to be fine. And they're not. Because he never had a plan. It was all bluster. It was all bull. But here he is again with a record this time going in front of, of working people at a non-union facility in Michigan. And this is the, the beautiful part of, of what our media does, how screwed up our media is. They're actually comparing this to what Joe Biden did. Biden went to the picket line where the workers were actually on strike. Trump has created some kind of, well, found a non-union employer to bring him in 
to be able to talk to all their employees. And weirdly, and this is the weird part, because a non-union employer doesn't want to promote unions, doesn't want his employees to think that unions are a good thing, so why bring Trump in? Not because he cares about the unions or those union workers, because he knows, that business owner knows, if Trump gets back into office, it's going to be better for him. Not those working stiffs, not those people who are out there punching the clock, doing the work. No, no, it's going to be good for him. And this is where we are. And what, what, the, what the scary thing is, is we have a, a mainstream corporate controlled media who is just, I, I don't get it anymore. Look, I'm not, I'm not a journalist and I don't pretend to be. But at some point, you cannot continue to have these both sidesism kind of, well, they're the same. No, these are not the same. You know, the fact that, you know, I was looking at some, some statistics today. And, you know, from, from the beginning of February until the 26th, or I mean, from the beginning of September, from the 26th of September, the New York Times op-ed section published 17 articles that mentioned the word Trump in indictment. During that same period, 39, 39, more than twice as many, included the word Biden's age. It seems like, again, it seems like they've got an agenda. And it's all about, well, everything. Our country is in real trouble. We've got a shutdown coming. We've got a former president who's assaulting democracy. And, and yet what we have is a main, mainstream media. We've got, a, look, the Trump Organization death penalty in New York State. This is real news. What do we get? We get Biden's age. We get the fact that <laughs> three quarters of voters say that they're more concerned about Biden's age and mental fitness. Two thirds are concerned about, about Trump's trials. It seems, it seems like the thumb kind of on the scale. And, and look, we are, we are steamrolling toward a shutdown that is going to be costly, it's going to be harmful, and what are we going to get? We're going to get Hunter Biden laptop. We're going to get, oh, you know, Joe Biden, Joe Biden got, you know, wires to his, to his house. The speaker. Now, look, I get when the right-wing bloviators, I get when, you know, talk radio goes through, oh, there's, there's, you know, cables going to his house, you know, uh, but when the Speaker of the House says bank records don't lie, Joe Biden's home in Delaware was listed as the beneficiary address for multiple money wires from China while he was running for president in 2019. Um, um, should I tell him? Now, look, again, I expect you know, crazy commentators to say this stuff, but Hunter Biden was living there. That, that was Hunter's house, too. That's where he lived. But no, 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 don't, 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 don't ask. And what I find amazing is <laughs> we've got a media uh, that that does not call this out as bunk. Uh, we're going to play this impeachment like it's serious, even though Republicans have nothing and have admitted they've got nothing because it's a distraction. It's a distraction from the fact that we're going to have a shutdown that they have chosen. For instance, and I got to throw this out because I'm starting to see McCarthy say, well, it's the Democrats' fault. The Democrats' fault. The, the Democrats won't, won't, won't help on the budget. It's because they're against border security. That's what it is. It's against, the, they're against border security. And you go, no, I don't think they are. Um, but aren't you the majority? Don't you have enough votes to move your agenda? How is it the Democrats' fault that you can't get your people in line? How is it the Democrats' fault again? How you can't do your job? Again, explain to me how it's the Democrats' fault for not allowing you to, uh, you know, to cut a couple million people off a of SNAP, uh, to take take meals on wheels money away. I explain to me how that's the Democrats' fault. And our media, they, they, oh no, you see the Democrats, they're not helping. 
it's it's angering it's frustrating but not surprising i want to hear your thoughts email me rick at the ricksmithshow.com gonna take a quick break right back after this with your thoughts stick around you're listening to the rick smith show for working people come to talk We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work... For America. The phone lines are open. Give Rick a call at 1 866 416 Rick. That's 1 866 416 7425. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So again, you know, as we've been saying, you know, they they lie they lie different today. Oh, the lion is a little bit different. As I said, there used to be a kernel of truth. There used to be a bit of of actual fact there. Uh, Not so much. For instance, you know, the big the big lie. You know, there was all this voter fraud. Millions, millions, millions of votes stolen. Ballot stuffed. Uh, Republican Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose in Ohio referred 521 cases of suspected voter fraud by non citizens since he's taken office. Um, how many do you think was actually charged? Again, you know, they got this whole state, couple, several million people. They've got lots of opportunity for all this this voter fraud. And if you listen to the Giuliani's and Trumps and you listen to all the all of the bloviators, it's just just riddled with with voter fraud. Do you know how many people they charged? One. One person. One. I gotta tell you, if you bat one out of five hundred and twenty one, you're well, you're not gonna get five hundred and twenty one at bats. Uh that isn't gonna happen. Very, very just well it is what it is let's go to the phones got steve on line one steve how are you i'm fine and i couldn't agree with you more with regards to the the old republican party which you know i mean they were amusing in terms of the lies that they told and there's a saying you know that a good lie is one part truth two parts exaggeration and three parts falsehood so that was the old republican party because you had to have a kernel of truth in there so that people could go after it so you know i nobody contends, for instance, that there's no voter fraud in this country. Yes, I mean, and most of it, it turns out, uh, happens with people such as who have two homes in two different states, and they actually forget that they mailed in a ballot in one place or cast a vote somewhere else, and then they do it twice. It's not anything intentional. I mean, you know, you've got a lot of elections where about half of Americans turn out, if that, and, and we're to believe that people are risking a felony conviction in prison time in order to cast votes erroneously in this country as non-citizens. So to forever forego their capacity to become citizens if they're caught. I mean, where on, on this planet uh, is anybody that desperate to vote? I mean, it's just sort of this ridiculous narrative. But, you know, it, the Bush administration did this study in which they looked at 500 million-plus votes cast over a number of elections. They found a couple of dozen actual attempts <laughs> by individuals to commit voter fraud. So, but the Republicans would have you believe that the millions upon millions of people did it in 2020. I, you know, so I mean, yes, yeah, you know that that's the sort of kernel of truth uh, that that the old style Republican Party. But you know what? What the, the MAGA nuts took from that was this, this ridiculous narrative of you know conspiracies and uh, and videos on TikTok and YouTube of ballots being burned or being found out in the wilderness and all this sort of nonsense. I mean, uh, and that was their that was their evidence. 
the problem was that every time somebody had to be under oath, you know, all of a sudden that narrative disappeared. Yep. You know, it was one thing to say it on Fox and Newsmax and One American News. No, no, that's fine because you're not under oath. But as soon as they got under oath, it became highly problematic. Witnesses disappeared and, oh, well, you know, and of course we got the Dominion settle, settlement for exactly that reason. And, and, and let's face it, I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, uh, a media that has been worked by the GOP for, for decades now because for a long time Americans have been fed the narrative that uh, media is left-wing, it's biased, it's, it's, uh, it's, de- it's Democratic run. And so, you know, there was this distrust that was developed by a whole section of, of the, the voting populace, and they, they fed into that belief system. So the media started to say, okay, we need to give the other side a voice. We need to keep giving them more and more of a voice. You know, this isn't fair, which is like saying, you know, in your geography class, we're going to teach mainstream geography and flat earth science. <laughs> no, there are some things that they're, that they're not two sides of, uh, on. We don't teach evolution next to creationism in our, in our biology classes for a reason. One is faith-based, the other is science-based. This idea that everything has equal value, no, it does not. I'm sorry. You know, you, in, in some strange alternative universe, that may be true, but in Western enlightened democracies, reason, rationality, logic, scientific methodology are supposed to be the guiding forces behind what we believe. So, yes, you've got to present me with evidence in order for, for me to believe that what you're saying is credible and an alternative to someone else's idea. And I, I mean, it, it's interesting in that tonight we've got the Republican debate, and uh, you know, it, it's rather amusing because you've got these people who are trying desperately to thread this needle, you know, in terms of who's going to come in uh, uh, second or third, who's going to win the, the silver medal and bronze medal, and of course, none of them want to attack the guy who's likely to win the gold medal, except to the, the extent that you know they might be able to tie their wagon to his, or somehow be an alternative to him if he were to you know kick over tomorrow because of the way he eats and dies. They, they feel that they could uh, take his slot and perhaps go on to be the nominee to run against Biden or perhaps be selected as vice president or, uh, or be selected to be part of the cabinet. You know, but they, they can't afford to attack him. But at the same time, they need to offer themselves up as an alternative to Trump. And, and as, as we move through this process, you know, we all know what happened yesterday with regard to the court decision. So, yeah, it's, it's a real question about where Trump will be uh, come primary time in this country and come uh, the, the convention and exactly what the GOP is going to do. Because there are adults in the, in the Republican Party, ca- contrary to what many people believe. It's just that they've decided to, to hitch their horse to, to this nut and to the MAGA movement because they think that that's where their party is. But they, uh, behind closed doors, they, they shake their heads and they're like, what, what has happened to our party? Yeah. When are we going to finally get rid of this? No, I see them as cowards. I mean, that's the reality. They're cowards and because uh, they won't take it on. So they're going to allow their party to go down. They're going to allow the country to be under attack because they're cowards. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, when Goldwater was seen as an extremist, Bill Buckley, who was not, no liberal by any means, went to Goldwater and said, okay, you've gone too far. This is, you know, this, this is on the borders of fascism in this country. And we are not, a, 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 we are not the Nazi party as Republicans. And, and, and we need Republicans to do that. We need them to stand up. And unfortunately, the ones that have stood up in the past, Liz Cheney and Mitt Romney and Adam Kinzinger and a few others, you know, they've been marginalized. What happened to them? You know, they're either retiring, forced out, or uh, been elected out of office. So, yeah, I mean, we, we really do need people with courage in that party to save their own party. I, I don't have any love for Republicans, but I do think we need a healthy two-party system in this country. I agree. And the other one and the other party can't be fascist. You know, it's just, it just <laughs> not going to work that way. I absolutely agree. I appreciate the thoughts, Steve. Always good stuff. Uh, let's go to uh, Alice on line two. Alice, how we how we doing? I'm tired. How about yourself? Uh, fighting the fight. What's on your mind? Well, like you, I'm just a little bit fed up with the way the media has been treating all of this. It's like every time I turn around, they are um, hyping up, you know, Trump once more. Oh, he's in Michigan. Oh, he's this, you know. And then all I hear about Biden is his age or, oh, my goodness, he tripped. Is he too old? He's got tennis shoes on. I don't know. Yeah, it's just insane. You know, and we're not hearing anything else about this. Did he buy the Glock or did he not? When, from what I've been given to understand, 
there's some guy over on uh, Truth Social, Trump's own net- network, that is swearing by all that's holy that uh, Trump did buy the Golden Glock. See, I'm, I'm going like, to stop. I'm going to stop here. I don't believe he bought it. I don't believe he bought it. And here's why. And I think I, I went through this the other day. Um, Trump doesn't buy anything. There's no way I see Trump reaching into his pocket and pulling out a dime to buy something. Now, did the, did the shop owner give it to him on the arm? I would believe that. But I don't believe Trump would ever buy anything. No, I'm with you, and that's what I was going to say. I don't think he would buy it. But I am surely certain that he would not be a, against being given it as a gift. But what I was going to say is, is, you know, maybe uh, somebody should kind of look into this. But, you know, we're too worried about, uh, you know, Joe Biden's got tennis shoes on. But have a good evening. Thanks, Alice. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, no, look, there's a, there's a bunch of this. I mean, you know, if you're going to go after Hunter Biden for this kind of stuff, um, for, for gun you know, related issues and, and not, you know, not being accurate. How about Kid Rock? How about D- Dumb Jr.? How about how about a bunch of people? Um, you know, look, if you're going to if you're going to use that, use it. Seems simple to me. Uh, but, you know, this is, again, one of these moments where you look at what what's been presented by our mainstream corporate controlled media. And look, Steve hit it right on the head. We've been told for years it's the liberal media, you know, all of the, the ABCs and the CBS, and the NBC, they're all liberal. And you go, no. They actually try and do some bit of journalism, and then they overcompensate. This is where the right is masterful. They attack, attack, attack. And then you get, uh, everyone's got rabbit ears. So now you got to play both, uh, both sides of them. Oh, well, you know, there's all of this stuff over here. But this little tiny thing that we've got to give them equal time. And, and look, you know, they've played it masterfully over the years. They've attacked the, the, the mainstream media. And, and they, like I said, they've got rabbit ears. Uh, baseball term for those who, who, who don't get that. Uh, you know, and we are where we are now to where it's 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 this both sidesism where you've got to give equal time for insanity. For instance, Joe Biden in a historic fashion walked on a picket line. Trump is having a, a, a rally at a non-union a non-union facility. Somehow in their world that's equal. Crazy. Back after this. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 2011. That was the day hundreds of ILWU strikers blocked railroad tracks near Longview, Washington. They hoped to stop grain shipments from moving in and out of the EGT grain terminal. Longshoremen had been sitting down on the tracks throughout the summer, resulting in over 100 arrests. No trains had moved in or out of the terminal since July. But then a federal judge issued an injunction against ILWU pickets. The BNSF Railroad tried to move grain once again. ILWU picketers in Vancouver were able to hold off the train until police forcibly dispersed the crowd. Then, hundreds gathered at Longview to block the train from coming in. That's when police went on the offensive. They used clubs and pepper spray against the longshoremen, arresting 19. They threw ILWU President Bob McElrath to the ground. Rumors spread that police had broken his arm. Hundreds of regional longshoremen rushed to Longview. The Seattle and Tacoma ports shut down in protest. The next morning, 10,000 tons of grain were opened onto the railroad tracks. The grain export terminal was the first to be built in the Pacific Northwest in almost 30 years. EGT hoped to undercut the powerful ILWU, who controlled operations at the port since its founding in the 1930s. The union refused to agree to work 12-hour shifts at straight time. The EGT hoped to break the hiring hall by refusing to recognize maintenance and inside workers at the terminal. They then attempted to fill jobs with workers from the operating engineers. But the ILWU persevered. By the end of January, EGT had backed off many of its demands. Negotiations resumed, and days later, the contract was signed. 
Oklahoma troubadour Woody Guthrie wrote a song about outlaws that was right on target. As through this world I've traveled, I've seen lots of funny men. Some will rob you with a six gun and some with a fountain pen. That could apply today to Clayton Bennett, a multimillionaire Oklahoma City banker who has regularly wielded his fountain pen to loot public funds for his private gain. Bennett is a Hall of Infamy player in the elite club of big league owners of pro basketball teams, specializing in picking taxpayers' pockets to finance his operations. In 2006, he and a few high-rolling partners bought the Seattle Supersonics team, promptly demanding that locals pony up $500 million to build a new arena for them. No, said Seattle. So Bennett and gang scampered off to Oklahoma City with the team, renaming it the Thunder. Then they used their fountain pens to filch a $215 million subsidy from local officials. Gratitude? Robbers don't say thank you. They refill their fountain pens. As Judd Legum reports in his excellent Substack report, Popular Information, Bennett is now demanding $850 million from Oklahoma City taxpayers to build a glittery new basketball palace for him. Legum notes that this is about $3,200 for every Oklahoma City household and that Bennett's take will deplete the budgets of about a dozen essential community projects. He also has an inside accomplice, the mayor. Having taken Bennett cash to get elected, Mayor David Holt is now warning taxpayers to hand over millions to his rich banker buddy or the thunder will leave town. This is Jim Hightower saying, so go, the thieving won't stop until the people stop the thieves. Boom, 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 ship the whole herd of thundering thieves out of town, including Bennett and that pusillanimous mayor. The Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So yesterday we talked about the big story coming out of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, evidently, a suit against Amazon, uh, the FTC, along with 17 attorneys generals from across the country, a bipartisan number of them. Uh, you've got the attorney gen attorneys general from Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, New Jersey, New Hampshire, New Mexico, Nevada, New York, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Wisconsin all signing on. Uh, and I know Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire are Republicans, uh, at least. Uh, and there's probably one or two more in there that I, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, so this is kind of a big deal. And what they're saying is, look, uh, there's some monopolistic practices here that are harming consumers. Uh, this finally something that needs to be addressed and here to share some thoughts and maybe give us some insight on what this is, what it means and where it's going to go or how long it's going to take. I've asked our good friend Randy Corgan to come talk with us. Randy's the uh, Secretary, Treasurer, and Principal Officer at Teamsters Local 1932. Their website, teamsters1932.org. Randy, thanks for taking time for us. Uh, thanks for having me, Rick. Yeah, it's a big announcement. Lots of uh, lots of moving parts. So, where would you like me to start? <laughs> so, start at you know, what what the goal here is. I mean, you know, Amazon has has been allowed to grow in 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 such an alarming rate. Uh, you know, I always say the great you know you know every behind every billionaire is a great crime. The great crime behind Amazon was they cheated states out of tax dollars for decades and got away with it. Um, and, and for me, it's it's about time we start reeling in just this uh, obscene power that they've they've gotten over our our retail industry. So for me, that's kind of where I want to start. Yeah, what you have is you you have a lot of institutions, and organizations, uh, and regulatory bodies that are finally getting up to speed on Amazon's multi-layered scams. Uh, you know they're. You have the scam of their drivers that are obviously dumping the responsibility on their uh, on the contractors, so-called contractors that have complete control. In this case with the FTC, what is blatantly obvious is that Amazon is using its leverage and influence on multiple layers of platforms in multiple industries to essentially force customers, consumers, and labor in a particular direction. It's monopsony and monopoly uh, sort of protections. And unfortunately, the laws, ironically, are not that good 
So when the FTC and other institutions, because obviously states can do this as well independently, and there are some states that are, there's a number of states that are actually working to do something very similar on, uh, on at the state level and, and file a lawsuit against them. So Amazon itself is really starting to be uncovered uh, for all of these, of their business model. Business model to dump responsibility on everybody, number one. Number two, to use a tremendous amount of money, influence, and power to force consumers and or force uh, buyers, uh, labor, workers, contractors into a space where they don't really have a choice. And that is actually not legal. And they may think it is when you have that much control, but it's not legal. And so now the FTC, obviously, as you pointed out, 17 AG, 17 attorney generals. Clearly, this would have come out earlier, I would say probably nine months ago, maybe even longer, more than a year. But as more AGs were signing on, uh, the way I understand it, clearly we're working very closely with this. We've, we've done a lot of work to help try to provoke this discussion and, and bring awareness directly through the FTC, meeting with them multiple times and pointing out specific areas saying, hey, when's this corporation and this company going to be checked at some level uh, based on their business model? So to have that many AGs on board, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, and look, and it's in a bipartisan fashion as well. I mean, this isn't, you know, because originally someone said, well, this is just a, this is just Joe Biden, the Democrats going after, uh, you know, a good God fearing American company. I'm going, no, 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 no. This is, this is, you know, people going, hold on. This, this beast has gotten too big. Uh, they well, are, they are controlling too much, too fast. I found this isn't really a, an issue that's like really about Democrats. We've actually you know, me being the national director for Amazon at the IDT, we have found a lot of support in the Republican Party around this issue because of the tech issue that's going on and how Amazon is controlling algorithms, controlling how certain patterns of behavior are working on the Internet. Uh, obviously, AWS has this incredible uh, influence over institutions and organizations and government to a level in which many Republicans are like, hey, this needs to be dealt with uh, and this needs to be addressed. And so it really isn't in any way like a partisan witch hunt. Now, do I think uh, a Republican uh, FTC chair, someone appointed by the Republican Party, would be chasing this down? Uh, maybe not. But clearly there's tons of Republicans that are saying, hey, you can't continue to beat down the consumer. You can't continue to try to capitalize completely corner the market and essentially has anybody been into a best buy lately yeah has anybody been into a lot of places that you that you got goods and services that you could touch and now don't because the market is completely shifted capitalists will say oh well that's just you know market demand uh, well when it's forced market demand by the way of using your overusing your influence in another industry and or another part of your company to then force suppliers, consumers, or labor to do something, that's actually against the law. Yeah, and, you know, I, was, I was looking at some of the other things that they're, uh, the complaints were that, you know, that if you want to be a seller on that platform, uh, you're highly, I, I got, how was it put, you're highly encouraged uh, to use their their delivery systems and their, their logistics and all of this stuff. And, and the, the costs of it, uh, you know, they were saying that if you're a seller on there, you're, you're lucky if you get half of, of what you sell because Amazon's grabbing the other half. And the numbers just seemed uh, really high. Yeah, they've got a, in a lot of ways, they've got a captive market and they've got a captive situation. So with that comes responsibility and there are a little, there's some rules when it comes to antitrust, uh, when it comes to uh, obviously issues around uh, trade commission. Federal Trade Commission and them uh, overexerting their influence in those particular. The, the one area that's that not a lot of people talk about is their advertising and the way they advertise. They advertise if you're on Amazon and the predatory advertising they do for their product over, let's say, uh, somebody Joe Schmo who's a small business owner who's got this really cool you know thing in the jigger, <laughs> and and Amazon goes out duplicates it figures out how to buy it, and then 
stuffs it at the top of the advertising algorithm so that they buy Amazon's product and not Joe Schmo's. That is one of the big things in the center of this. That it's like that is absolutely misleading. That you're you are using your platform as far as the retail platform to manipulate the advertising platform to then support your delivery platform. Sorry. That's stuff you're not supposed to be doing because once they have complete control of a market like that, then you have the situation like you do where wages, uh, product, supply completely gets controlled by a very small percentage of individuals. So and that's could, that's the reason for the rules. So what could be done here? I mean, this is, you know, every article I'm, I'm reading is saying this is going to be a several year long process. Uh, and as you said, the, the laws aren't aren't really great. Uh, what is the goal here then? Is it? Uh, I've read that their their goal at this moment isn't to break them up, although I think at some point you have to. I think they've gotten so big, so powerful, so destructive that I think you can't let them grow any bigger. But that's that's just my view. If it's not breaking them up, what is the goal right now? Actually, I think the goal is ultimately going to have to be to break them up, and they have to they have to break apart a piece. So whether they break apart the transportation piece or they break apart the advertising piece or you break apart the retail platform. The problem is the way all of these platforms are integrating with one another is creating a, an anti-competitive marketplace. It's creating a system in which it's impossible uh, for anybody to compete, especially if you're asking for, for the product to come in and advertise, and then you're literally working back against the very product you've asked to come and advertise, and obviously run it into the ground. And at some point, the, the, the question has got to be what part of it breaks up. You can do the old bell, look back at the old bell breakup, right, uh, with telephones across the country, a telephone service. And that was what, uh, early 80s, right? Um, now, with Ma Bell, right, that that breakup was different in the sense because it was, it was a monopoly, but everybody was represented in it. Almost everybody was 100% represented and unionized. And so you had the workforce uh, that wasn't as negatively impacted as you have in this situation right. where most of the workforce uh, is not unionized. So, so let me ask you this, because, you know, there are people who say, well, you know, it works. It works great. I, I go on the website. I find what I want. It's cheaper than going to the Best Buy. Uh, it's delivered to my door the next day. You know, why do you why do you want to screw this up? Yeah. At what cost? The, the, the point is that could very well be true. But if you broke the rules and broke the law and you manipulated every if, if you manipulated everybody else that was advertising on the platform to eventually erode the ability for, for people to be profitable and that the companies, small business to be profitable, and you're the only one that can be profitable in that system, well, that doesn't work for anybody but you. And ultimately, what is it going to be? Everything on the Amazon is made by Amazon, is is created by them, is advertised by them, and is delivered by them. Like that's not the original goal of Amazon. The original goal of Amazon was a marketplace for everyone to come and sell their goods, and Amazon would be the connection, or it would be the retail, essentially the retail outlet. They would advertise. They would be the retail outlet, and then help get it there. Well, now that they've closed the loops and trying to control from supply all the way to deliver at your door and the way in which they went about doing it on top of it becomes very predatory. And yes, you may say I get it for cheaper. Again, at what cost? Is it gonna cost you your job someday? That let's use let's use people in transportation. If you're used to making thirty dollars an hour, you've been a truck driver for you know twenty five years, and now Amazon says we're gonna take over the transportation part of uh, picking up and delivering certain product that now puts you out of a job and they're, we're going to pay people $20 an hour and they're not going to have benefits, not going to have the rest of it. You're going to be okay with that because something was a little cheaper when you ordered it. No, it's an excellent point. Uh, which is, which is why I, I wanted to ask you about, you know, the story I saw a couple of days ago that said, you know, Amazon drivers are now kind of looking at UPS uh, and going, Hey, uh, that's a good contract you got there. Uh, those are good wages. Those are good benefits. Uh, you know, and now going, Hey, how do we get that? Uh, are, are you seeing an increase in interest in, in, in drivers and, and Amazon folks going, Hey, uh, we want some of that. Oh, absolutely. Not only are we seeing an increase in 
drivers at Amazon, uh, we've seen inc increase in drivers in the industry. One, because of the victory at UPS, but two, because of the awareness around that discussion, awareness around getting people to, getting the general public to understand the process of what workers go through when they're union. And then lastly, the most impactful thing that has actually spurred workers uh, in, at Amazon to say, hey, what about me, is these workers in Palmdale that have been on strike since June have been extending pickets. They did it just two days ago. Uh, they're, they, they've been doing it at least once a week, if not uh, more than that, since June 24th. They've, they're extending pickets to locations. These locations are, are other drivers or warehouse workers that are saying, can you bring your picket to us? We want to demonstrate with you. We want to walk off the job with you. We want to also push back on Amazon. And how does this tie together? In the next month or so, you're going to see a big decision come down from the National Labor Relations Board. And I'm sure you're going to be calling me and asking me to be on it because I happen to be right in the center of this one that is challenging Amazon's business model on that subcontracting uh, system. And that, that these are actual Amazon drivers. Amazon drivers realize that they work for Amazon, not these subcontractors. Right. They, it's going to take us a while to explain that to a couple hundred thousand of these drivers, right? This doesn't happen overnight because it's big and it's massive. And you have a legal uh, barrier to get over, which is they've employed them through subcontractors. So we have to smash through that legal barrier. And then we have to get the workers to demand directly to Amazon saying, hey, you need to recognize us as Amazon drivers and you need to recognize what we're seeking in working conditions and pay. That is currently happening right now. So you have that, you have the UPS thing, you have UAW workers striking, you have the FTC, and you have a number of other things where institutions and regulatory bodies are pushing back on Amazon saying, your business model is, is hurting communities, it's hurting workers, it's hurting the workforce, it's hurting consumers. You know, people are gonna have to start to take notice on this and workers have the ability to control most of it, which is demand more, take direct action, walk off the job and say, I want a union contract and I want some wages that maybe be comparable to UPS. Would they get UPS type wages out the gate? Probably not, you gotta work towards that, but definitely improve over the position in which they're in right now and get other workers to join them in that fight in the industry. Yeah, I find it interesting when we see the Amazon drivers in our area, uh, they all have the, the, uh, the Amazon clothing on, they're driving the van with the Amazon name on it, uh, they're being told where to go, how to get all this stuff, and somehow, oddly enough, they're not Amazon employees, which is kind of weird to me. But there, more and more of them are recognizing that that Amazon's sort of, this. The Amazon just, just released what, uh, it was like a week and a half ago saying that they were going to invest $440 million into the DSP network to give drivers at the DSPs, which is the subcontractor, more money. Well, that sounds great as far as a whole number is concerned. But when you break that out among everybody, it's 75 cents an hour. Like, that's a huge number. And in the same article, it shows how these DSPs have generated more than 39 billion billion dollars for Amazon, but they only wrote a check for 440 million. Uh... <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 again, it's the reason why we need folks like you out there pushing, doing the work and, and organizing. Uh, and you guys do a great job of this. Last question I got to ask you, though, be uh, before I let you go. Yesterday, a historic day, uh, the president walked a picket line uh, in Michigan with the striking UAW members. Is this a big deal in your mind? Oh, absolutely. I think it sends a message. Look, we have, you and I have talked about how politicians and the political scene and policymakers have a tendency to try to walk, try to walk this neutral line. At a certain point, these elected officials have got to say, I am standing with working people and send a message that you're with the working people, not stand at a, at a, at a non-union plant and you know, bolster about all this other stuff, to literally hold the picket sign, say, I agree with you in your fight. What's it going to take to make this happen? He said he's made all these appointments. Now, he's not just said. We can see he's made a number of appointments to policy-making positions within his cabinet and within the administration to try to help. But to stand on a picket line, it is unprecedented. It has never happened. The only thing you can bring close to this on the other side is when Reagan 
broke the picket line with uh, with the traffic air traffic with controls the did the, the opposite pillars. effect and thrusting himself into the center of this now now you have a president thrusting himself into the center of this on their side I'm right there with you Randy I appreciate the time as always great stuff and yes uh, when that decision comes down I will be calling absolutely looking forward to that yeah, me too. Thanks so much, Randy. Appreciate it. Uh, Randy Corgan, Secretary, Treasurer, and Principal Officer, Teamsters Local 1932. Check out their website, Teamsters1932.org. We'll get links out on social media. You can take a look at that. we we'll take a quick break. Right back. Stick around. Listen to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. Phone lines are open. Give Rick a call at 1-866-416-RICK. That's 1-866-416-7425. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1903. That was the day that is remembered in Virginia as the wreck of Old 97. Old 97, also known as the Fast Mail, was a Southern Railway freight train. It carried the U.S. mail from Washington, D.C. to Atlanta, Georgia. The train wreck happened on the leg of the trip from Monroe, Virginia to Spencer, North Carolina. The train had come in late to Monroe. It was reported that the railway company ordered the engineer to increase the speed of the train to make up time. The company had to pay a penalty if they delivered the mail late. But when the train neared Danville, Virginia, the tracks curved at the Stillhouse Trestle Bridge. The speed was simply too much. Despite the engineer's efforts to slow the train, it careened off the tracks and plummeted to the rocky ravine 45 feet below. 11 of the 16 people on board the train died including the conductor, the engineer, and the flagmen and both firemen. The railway company blamed the wreck on the deceased engineer. Newspapers across the country carried photos of the wreck. The disaster became the subject of multiple ballads. One version by Vernon Dalhart in 1924 is thought to be the first million-selling country record in U.S. history. Johnny Cash recorded another well-known version of the song. In 1993, an alternative country band took the name The Old 97s, hearkening back to the disaster and the songs it inspired. They gave him his orders at Monroe, Virginia, said, Steve, you're way behind time. This is not 38, this is old 97. You must put her in to spend her own time. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Labor History in 2. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. I gotta tell you, I, uh, I saw this Marjorie Taylor Greene bet. And again, she's buying to be vice, P- vice president. She's buying, buying to be Trump's number two. Uh, and with, you know, uh, steaming piles of number two like this, you know, it kind of makes you go, oh, I, yeah, I can see her as, uh, as, as the number two to Trump. Uh, but she was talking about the Taliban and Afghanistan. And, and you know, again, you know, the back to what, what I've been saying, you know, in the old days, there used to be some, some, some truth to the lie. There'd be a kernel, there'd be something. Um, but now that just, uh, well, it's just making stuff up. So, uh, so Marjorie had, had, well, she had this to say. And President Trump would have never left the Afghan people in complete ruin and be controlled by a terrorist government, the Taliban. That is the complete excuse. Democrats need to stop blaming President Trump and his administration for Joe Biden's failures. I urge the House to adopt my amendment, Madam Chair, to take Secretary Lloyd Austin's salary using the Holman Rule, which is a rule that allows us to fire failures that are serving our government and serving our country. Lloyd Austin is not serving the United States military. Lloyd Austin is leading it into failure. And with that, Madam yeah, that she, uh, they wanted to pay him a dollar on all this. But, but understand, all of that Afghanistan stuff, all of that, Trump's fault. He's the guy who set the deadline. He's the guy who put all of that into, into motion. And, and again, create a crisis, create a problem, you, you cause a mess. 
and then blame someone else. You look at the economy, same thing. The mess happened under Trump's watch. Massive mess. Whether you go, well, you know, it was a pandemic, Rick. Yeah, it was. Uh, one that they handled badly right from the start. Because, well, they wanted to politicize it. And, uh, well, you know, he didn't want to look silly with a mask and have his makeup seen. They did this. And now, again, the spin or the total BS, it's all Biden's fault. Everything. Everything's got to be Biden's fault. Because it's, it's all they can do. All they can do is project. Now, this is the same woman who said that, you know, the other... You know, Ukraine is, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're harvesting babies. And you go, where do you make this stuff up from? Oh, yeah, Alex Jones. And the thing is, is she's now the mainstream of that party. She was the fringe. She is now <laughs> the titular head of the Republican Party. She's, she's it. Uh, she was at the gun store in South Carolina with Donald Trump. She's a congresswoman from Georgia. I know it's just a couple hour drive up the road, but not her district. So does that tell us anything? Well, yeah, potentially. Potentially it tells us that she she could be on the ticket, which, you know, I, I got to tell you, he would... I go back to Sarah Palin, and and I we were pretty I was pretty mean to Sarah Palin. Uh, I will probably have to apologize because this this woman, much 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 worse. But you look at how the Republican Party has gone off the rails, election cycle after election cycle, going further and further and further from reality. And it's one of those things where it'd be easy to quip about you know well this is why we need more more funding for mental health. Uh, this is why we need, you know, more, you know, state hospitals to take care of, you know, people with, with, with mental illness. We shouldn't be electing them to public office. I'm just kind of throwing that out there as, as an aside. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Got questions, comments, something on your mind, want to hear it. If you miss any portion of the program, make sure you grab the podcast. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can find ours uh, I'm just, again, just, it's amazing to me where we are. Uh, we're steaming towards a shutdown. And it's happening because one of the political parties does not have a vision of what to do. Thanks, Republicans. Back after this. Pray for rain. Uh, but we're going to we're going to do everything we can uh, 